Welcome, everybody, to our first uh, engineering webinar for 2024. We had a good year back in 23 with some very good uh, programs, and we appreciate everybody joining in uh, last year. We've got some more scheduled for uh, this year. And uh, our, I'm Larry Wilkins, the host of the, uh, the webinar today. And normally, the, um, uh, normally our co-host is with us. Uh, John George, but he's down in sunny Florida, although he did tell me this morning it's pouring down rain and he's at a transmitter site installing a new transmitter and he was going to try to join us, but uh, the electricians are in there beating and banging around in the transmitter. And he said, I was going to get outside, but he said it's pouring down rain. I said, well, at least that's not as bad as it is <laughs> up up here. So I uh, want to welcome everybody to our to our webinar. The webinar, as most of you know, is underwritten by the Max Connect Group. This is a full service broadcast service uh, uh, company. They sell and service equipment every, for radio stations, everything from microphones to the antenna. And they have a full service department that if you have problems, they can come in and, and uh, fix it for you or work on it for you. And then they also have a department that will actually do turnkey. If you're building a new facility, then you can contact uh, Max Connect Group. There you see the website on the web on the uh, slide www.maxconnect. And notice the spelling; it's sort of weird. Maxconnect.com. And uh, Josh Bond is the the head of that operation, and you can talk to him about it. Our program today, I think, is going to be a very good one because every radio and every television station has at least one or multiple wireless systems, microphones, in-ear, IFB systems. And we also find out that a lot of engineers, uh, as I travel around and talk to them, a lot of engineers are also involved in live audio, either at their church or they freelance do setting up sound systems for concerts and stuff like that. So there's a lot of wireless stuff going on and a lot of problems that crop up with wireless. We're very happy to have with us today uh, Don Boomer, he's with RF Venues, uh, based out of Boston, I think he said. And uh, Don's over in uh, in California this morning and uh, drinking his first cup of coffee. And Don, welcome to the program. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. Yeah, we I wanted to have him on today. And, and what we wanted to do is just talk in generalities about RF systems, uh, how you go about uh, setting it up and troubleshooting and and things that you run into, and we talked about that a little bit before we went on the on the air. So, Don, uh, tell us a little, first of all, a little bit about the company and, and what the company does. So, um, we make aftermarket antenna products for wireless microphones. Um, you all read the balanced budget amendment of 1997, all 2,000 pages of that. Um, part of that, it's like they put so many things in these bills, it's crazy. So that's really when um, we started moving towards digital television. Um, and and so we could see with that uh, coming that a lot of things were going to change. And frankly, wireless microphones up until, well, it took a long time to implement all the digital TV stuff. I'm not sure it's 100% done, but... Um, so we could, we could see that it was going to become much more difficult. Um, the wireless microphone manufacturers, their primary business is making wireless microphones and receivers. That's where all the big money is. And so for years and years and years and years, they just use standard accessories because they work great. You know, 10 years ago, you probably could have stuck a coat hanger in the back of your radio and made it work. Uh, I've done it <laughs> when somebody forgot to bring the antennas. I come from a live sound background. Um, and, you know, you could make things like that work. But unfortunately, now, if you're in a metro area, I mean, we're probably looking at only 6% of the available bandwidth that we had five or 10 years ago. So now you really got to pay attention to what you're doing. You don't want to give anything away. Um, so if you're, if you're, smart at least with all the rules of thumb i mean that should more than get anybody where they need to go uh, but beyond that engineers need to know stuff for for designing gear but just using it as a as an end user 
um, it, you know, there's just some basic things that are not well understood uh, because some of them <laughs> actually seem inside out and backwards. But um, so anyway, we, we saw that coming. Um, the, the guy that started our company, unfortunately, passed away last year, but um, designed an antenna that eliminated polarization crossfade dropouts. And I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. And we started from there. So we built this antenna system that, uh, you know, for years I went out and, and swapped out antennas with people and they just never had any more problems because while it, it's incredibly simple, it's a, it was a brilliant solution. And we started going from there. Well, what else can't people get? What else do people need that's, um, you know, that's not that's not uh, up to snuff? And so that's that's basically what we make. We make we make um, the antennas, distribution systems, uh, cabling. Uh, we have an RF over fiber system for anybody doing. You know, if you're trying to get your wireless mics to work out, you know, on the 17th hole of the golf course and you got to run, you know, 600 feet of coax, that's not going to work. So we make that kind of a solution, too. So that's kind of that's kind of where we are. We don't make any wireless microphone products. Uh, our stuff works with everybody's. I mean, basically, radio waves are radio waves, right? It's a universal force of nature. So there nobody has any proprietary radio waves. So everything works, mixes and matches well. And uh, that's that's kind of how we got our start. I think we've got now, at last count, about twenty thousand installations that use our products. Um, we've we've really been kind of going for about about ten years at this point, um, and uh, now we're growing quite rapidly uh, as we're uh, as we're adding more and more products. So that's kind of where we came from. Uh, located in Boston. Uh, right next to the stadium where the where the Boston Patriots play football. Uh, on a football weekend, you can't get to our job. But, um, <laughs> right. And I'm not kidding. You, you wait two hours in traffic. But um, anyway, so. Um, yeah, I think uh, most people that, that use wireless equipment, both mics and, uh, and in-ears for IFBs and TV stations and stuff like that, uh, Sort of at the beginning, the only thing that comes to mind is make sure that I'm not on the same frequency as somebody else. Well, mm -hmm. there's a lot more to that than that, because I, I actually uh, worked for years with the uh, Auburn University uh, football program doing the on-site engineering for the network. And then when I we had wireless stuff there and I always just out of courtesy, I would always always go down before the the day of the game while they're setting up down to the TV truck just to make sure I wasn't on some of one of their frequencies. Well, when I stopped doing the actual on the air uh, football games, the college hired me or the athletic director called me and said the SEC had just issued a notice that they wanted all SEC colleges to have a frequency coordinator at their local stadium. So they asked if I would take that job, which I did. And at the beginning, that was what I looked at was to make everybody was on a separate frequency. But I quickly learned this is there's a lot more to it than just making sure that that you don't have people on top of each other. And I could tell you some horror stories about things that happen. But uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, we talked about that before we went on the air about. About things you don't that a lot of engineers don't think about about wireless systems. Well, can I can I share my screen here with you? Yeah, sure. All right. Let me kick this up. Give me just a second here to push the right button. And uh, boom, there. Did you get my screen? Yeah, I got it. Okay. So, um, well, what I what I really wanted to talk about is um, why wireless microphones drop out because this is it, right? We need to talk in this microphone. And we need to make sound and we need to keep making sound and it needs to, you know, be very reliable. Really, if you think about it, you'd say, well, I'm on the air 99.9% .9 of the time. That would mean you had four seconds of dead air every hour. Not acceptable. So um, what 
so I have this little presentation because I think once you understand there is one single factor that makes all this work or not work. Um, and uh, this is it. So um, basically what you have to do to make a wireless mic work, and we're IFB, same thing, right? radios are radios. It depends whether it's coming or going, but it's all the same uh, technically. So what keeps your mic on the air is something called capture effect. And so when you can get the signal from your transmitter through the air into your antenna, down the coax, into the electronics, down into the receiver, when that signal gets there and it's 20 dB above the noise floor, your radio locks to that signal. And that's the only signal it sees. It disregards all the rest. Below that, your antenna is literally picking up every radio that's turned on on the planet of every frequency. Now, most of it's extremely low, but everything's going in there, right? Because antennas have no distance limit, right? We're still picking up Voyager 1 that's 900 million miles past Pluto, however many miles Pluto away is. Um, and that's still, that little tiny radio is still transmitting back to Earth. So there's no limit on the antenna what happens is as as the antenna gets weaker you're getting closer to the noise and when you get too close to the noise when you when you can't lock this margin in uh, your radio doesn't lock anymore so uh let's see here so uh these are typically the things that cause your radio to drop out you get out of range your antennas aren't polarized or focused aimed or you're getting too many multi-path reflections cancellations if you're old enough to remember analog tv we used to call them ghosts right get the rabbit ears out hold them up put the tin foil on it okay that's what you're doing you were trying to deal with multi-path so range um is probably the one everybody thinks they know the most but it's not distance it's distance that's usable so interference gets in our way just like in this picture you know, you can't see through the smoke. You got to have a clear, a clear um, shot. Uh, so um, what you're what you're really looking at here is something that looks kind of like this. Um, there's a noise floor. So we're, we're going to talk about 470 to 608. There's some other spots available, but basically this is where we're using wireless mics, uh, and all the principles hold. But it's just you know, other than call out all these little little exceptions we'll just talk about this so if we look at this range we have a noise floor we have a noise floor it's present everywhere on earth it is caused by every radio that's turned on it's caused by every electric motor that's turned on it's caused by every computer chip um you know it's caused by what do they call that microwave background radiation left over from the big bang i mean there's stuff coming from outer space and all this stuff, and it should be very, very, very low, but there is a an amount of RF present wherever you are in any venue. The thing that's happened recently in the last few years, um, down at the low end of the band, is we are getting interference frequently from LED-operated things, particularly video monitors, uh, LED stage lighting, you get a little below that, you've got security radios and stuff for you guys that are out on location. Um, and and what happens is these, these other things mix with our wireless mics. That's why you were saying, even if you're just using it, you know, uh, making sure you're not stepping on somebody else's frequency. Their other frequency, even if you're not stepping on them, is mixing and creating additional noise. At the top of the band, about from the middle of the band up, we now have interference from 5G cell phones, uh, T-Mobile, the pink lightning bolts, right? Those are mixing and adding extra noise. And then, of course, there's over-the-air television, uh, which you're not going to compete with because they've got 500 kilowatts and you've got milliwatts. So um, you can't use those. So in this drawing, the, the microphones, you see the ones that are above that line. And of course, that's an approximation. It's, it would be much more jagged than that. But if you're above that 20 dB threshold above the, the noise floor, and I'm not counting the TV stations, 
those mics should lock and be rock solid. They're not going to go anywhere. As you get very close to that or below that level, those microphones might not work at all, might work perfectly, but most likely they'll be ratty. You'll get little, little momentary dropouts. So um, we have we have a, well, so we're talking about dynamic range. So we could increase the broadcast power of the transmitter, but the FCC limits that so we don't step all over everybody else. Or what we can do is try to reduce the noise floor. And that's really the tool that we have at, at, uh, at our disposal. We have this um, calculator. So engineers do a thing, we do what's called a link budget and we can add up. You're basically adding up all the gain and then subtracting all the loss between your transmitter and your receiver to make sure that you have at least 20 dB of signal when you get there. Um, we have this little tool on our website Free to use. We don't collect any information. You don't have to register nothing. So if you go to our website, rfvenue.com, on the top of every page, there's a uh, a button that says uh, tools. And if you click on that, there's a couple of couple of tools that we've got you can use. Um, this one, the, the wireless, wireless performance calculator, you simply go to those drop down boxes and tell us what you've got. Tell me what kind of mic you got, what brand it is. Tell me, you know, some distances, how long your coax cables are, what your antenna looks like, blah, blah, blah. You get to the bottom and you hit that calculate button. And if you get a green light, that means you have more than 20 dB of signal that will get to that uh, receiver. Now, you still have to find an open frequency, but that means you have enough power available. Now, you've got to just put it in a spot where you got an open frequency. So that's an easy way to kind of figure out what you've got. So some other things that you can do to help shrink the noise floor. Um, the first one is uh, get rid of all the antennas you can. You only need two in a normal size venue, unless we're talking about something really huge. But in a, you know, in a space that would hold a thousand or fifteen hundred people, you you just want one A and one B antenna when you're using your your uh, wireless mics because the inter the antennas actually interfere with each other unless you put them about six feet apart. In this case, that would take an awfully big bench to get that many six feet apart. Because what happens when a current crosses your antenna, I mean, when a radio wave crosses your antenna, it generates a current, the antenna flows down the wire into the radio and you got a radio. However, according to Maxwell's law, when that happens, you're also generating a magnetic field. And so you have a very weak, but you have a very definite electromagnet you've just made out of your antenna. If they're close together like this, and close by close together, I mean closer than six feet, okay? At that point, that magnetic field can jump from one antenna into the other. Uh, where it will just be noise in that other antenna. So you've actually raised the noise floor. We don't want to do that. So we need to keep our antennas separated. Also, when you get a bunch of antennas that are haphazardly placed together, you create arrays. Now we can design, we can do that purposely. We do all the math and that's how we make paddle antennas and things like that or just multi-elements. But they're very well calculated uh, to give us a smooth result. So just like when you stack speakers together, you know about line array speakers, when you stack antennas together, you get an array. If you haven't done it the right way, what you end up with is, is hot and cold spots. That's the easiest way to put it. So across your stage, you're, you're going to be have a solid thing, and then the actor's going to drop in a hole in your solid, and who knows what, who knows what it's going to be. It's be very hard to calculate. Um, another thing, for you guys maybe that are ham radio, you, you know about Vizboire reflected power, but most people aren't aware. When you're just using a wireless microphone, that signal travels through the air, uh, goes into the antenna down into the receiver, but the receiver kicks part of it back out the antenna. So you're at, that antenna is actually transmitting at the same time it's receiving. It's, it's bounced back out. And again, if you've got other antennas that are very close to that, now it's screaming in the other antenna's ear, so to speak, raising the noise floor. So we don't want to do that. So the simple thing is you want to use a distro. 
The distro allows you to use a pair of antennas. You want an A and a B antenna for diversity. And then um, these are some distros we make. Uh, and then you can power multiple receivers. You can make really big systems if you want. Um, and uh, but this is so this is going to eliminate the antenna interference by using this distro. Uh, we this one that we make this distro nine at the bottom. This is um, this is actually the the best quality uh, multicolor multicoupler distro you can buy on the market because it has um, an enormous amount of headroom, about twenty dB more than anything else. Because another thing that happens, like you were saying, even though you got a clear frequency, somebody else is around you. When you put two radios together, or multiple radios, I should say, you create intermodulation distortion. Those two, based on the frequencies of your two, of your two radios, let's just talk about two, um, the transmit power and the proximity to each other. So as they get closer together, it gets worse when Romeo and Juliet are singing the love ballad and their microphones are six inches apart. They're going to create an enormous amount of other spikes. And those other spikes, if you've got other radios or IFBs going, could knock those off the air. Now, when Romeo and Juliet let go of each other and they move farther apart, those spikes go down, but they've moved closer to somebody else. So some other spikes go up. So this gets to the point, this is why we use frequency coordination software. So we can calculate exactly what frequencies will interfere the least with each other. It's very predictable. But at the point that you've got eight radios, there's literally 42,000 of these points that I can calculate. Most of them are extremely low. But again, as people walk around, some of them are gonna be hot, some of them are gonna poke up their heads, and then some are going to dip down. So you can you kind of need to know where all these are so that you can uh, you can uh, avoid avoid interference. So that uh, that distro nine that we have, the trick to that is we have a, we invented a divide by three circuit. Everybody else does divide by two. It just means you got to go through more electronics and more electronics, obviously, no piece of electronic gear is perfect. They've all got little distortion, a little noise. So going through fewer electronics is a better way to do it. Because what happens, radios are notoriously nonlinear. Not, you know, maybe your hi-fi equipment, it has an intermodulation distortion figure that's probably 0.01% at full power. Well, radios go to hell at about a third power. It gets it gets crushed down. Whoops. And that, that waveform gets compressed. And when it gets compressed, you're generating these harmonics. So we want to avoid, we want to avoid um, intermodulation by using a, a frequency coordination program. Uh, there's lots of them on the market, lots of free ones. We have a free one on our website. Um, uh, and, you know, that's going to lower the noise floor, you know, a little bit, a dB here, a dB there can make a big difference because we're shooting for 20. Now, on a good day, you might get 30, you might get 35. And if you do, you can make lots of mistakes. You can make mistakes all the way down till you cross that threshold at about 20. And it's not an exact number. It depends on some things. So there's a little bit of a fudge factor built into that. So these are some things we, we want to use fewer antennas or spread them very far, more than six feet apart but it's better just to use the distro. I want to talk about polarization. Uh, and this is really why we built the company. So what that means is antennas need to be focused at each other. Basically, monopole antennas like this, paddles, whips, that kind of thing, um, they transmit in a straight line. And so if your transmitter and your receiver or in the same plane, I don't care whether it's vertical, horizontal, or any angle in between. As long as they're both the same, things are good. Uh, you know, we used to have, there's a TV tower and it's broadcasting to an antenna on top of your roof. Nothing's moving. So we don't have to worry about it. But with wireless mics, what we have to worry about is things are moving. And so as people bend and twist, if your antenna isn't moving with them, it's constantly uh, losing signal. So let me show you, I built a little dipole antenna, just two pieces of wire calculated at the frequency of this little walkie talkie with an LED in the middle. 
And you can see when the transmit antenna and the receive antennas are in the same plane, I got enough level in that antenna to light the light. But if I turn it sideways and key it, it won't light. It's not getting enough signal. So um, again, it doesn't matter if it's upside down, as long as they're in the same plane, right? So, so you've got zero to 90 degrees four times in 360. So you have to pay attention that your antennas line up. Otherwise, you start losing lots of signal. So just the easiest way to illustrate this, if, if you consider a handheld mic and we hold it vertically and you had your, your two antennas for your diversity and they're both, um, uh, likewise, they're both vertical. At this point, you would have no loss. Um, uh, your antenna would be able to capture as much signal out of the air as your receiver was capable of doing. Obviously, $3,000 radios do it better than $300 radios, but each one of them would be operating at its, uh, at its best. If you turn your transmitter 45 degrees, you'll lose 3 dB of signal in each one of these antennas. That's almost never a problem. Uh, but if you manage to turn your transmitter all the way horizontal, you would lose over 20 dB of signal in both these antennas at the same time, and you're most certainly off the air. So that means your your when you have this situation, your receiver is seeing less than one percent of the power that was transmitted when that when that uh, uh, transmitter was uh, lined up. So this is this is why we got in business. Uh, we invented this diversity series antennas that have both a vertical and a horizontal element to them. So you have, you're picking up in 90 degrees in both ways. Uh, the, maybe some of you guys have used that one there on the left. That's the most popular one. That's a diversity fin. The one at the bottom is an omnidirectional version. If you have to cover a big field or something and things are coming at you from all over the place. Uh, the white square one is an install one that you guys won't be interested in. It's a flat version of that, of that, uh, that one on the left. But let me show you how this works because it works the same way. The physics are the physics. Um, when you, again, when you start vertically, um, you have one vertical element and one, and one horizontal element. So you have one side that's perfect and one side that's perfectly horrible, right? And diversity just switches to the better side. It ignores the other side. Again, at 45 degrees, I'm 45 degrees to both elements in that. But um, when I turn horizontal, my former perfect antenna becomes perfectly horrible and my former bad antenna becomes perfect. So you now have added polarization diversity to the, to the spatial diversity that your receiver has. So you will have eliminated dropouts. Let me show you, we did a little field test here during COVID. I got a pair of paddles and uh, set them up six feet apart like they should be, ran them to one receiver and I used our diversity fin and ran it to another receiver. And I tuned them both to the same channel so we could hit them with a single transmitter. So we got our lab assistant, actually our golden retriever assistant. This is Peg. And we put the transmitter on Peg. And then we got our random pattern generator, also known as a Frisbee. And we played catch with the dog out in the field for half an hour, right? The dog's going left, right, up, down, every way we could go. And at the end of 30 minutes of the dog chasing the Frisbee, the side with the two paddles had dropped out nine times. Uh, the diversity fin didn't drop out and won't drop out. This is an antenna that provided you have line of sight. That's the only qualifier. This antenna will never lose the signal. Uh, what happened on the other side is both sides went bad at the same time. Um, let me show you one other element of this. So multipath is a polarization thing, but most people separate it out. So again, this antenna switches uh, based on, you can see moving the transmitter and you can see it go back and forth between A and B. And of course it better do what I just said it would do because you're only two feet away and nobody operates like that, nor should you. But when, you, when you're out in the real world, even though he's holding that transmitter nearly perfectly uh, vertically, you can see the A and the B is jumping on the receiver. And that's because in this case, what we're getting is a million reflections off the walls, 
the floor, the ceiling, especially anything metal. And so those are all coming out of phase different times. And now the receiver is looking at a whole bunch of things, trying to figure out what's going on. And, you know, what's going on are echoes. And so receivers are very good at figuring this out. But there will come a point where it can't do it anymore. Um, and as that happens, that dynamic range is is dropping. That's what happens when this happens. Um, so the thought is, well, what if I turn my antennas, just my two paddles, I use one vertical and one horizontal. And I'm going to tell you, that's a great idea. It'll cut your chances of having this kind of a fade out in half, but it won't eliminate it. Because what happens is when you've spread those two antennas apart like they need to be, they're not each seeing the same radio wave. They're each, they're each looking at a different radio wave. And as we saw with the dog, um, they can both drop out. They can both go bad. Um, our antenna, because the two elements are co-located in a single point in space. So that's the other trick. Your antennas can be co-located or they can be six feet apart. That's what they need to be. Uh, when you co-locate them, both antennas are seeing the same radio wave. So they both have to just now just judge it based on angle. But they're only, they can only look at one wave, and that wave has to be somewhere between 0 and 90. So the antenna basically just will never lose that signal, and you'll never have a polarization crossfade. Um, when you get to IFBs or IEMs, um, most all of those are single-ended. Uh, they're not diversity. So you're only dealing with one, um, one receiver because it's difficult to engineer in a very small portable pack um, something that will run for a long time on a battery and be small. We don't have room to put another radio in it and it would eat the batteries like crazy. So what we do for this is we need to use what's called a circular polarized antenna. And what happens here is that this antenna, if you were to take that covering off, it kind of looks like a corkscrew. Uh, you know, if you watch the football game, you'll see the guy running down the sideline with a parabolic reflector and a, and a corkscrew antenna. That's a circular polarized antenna. Um, and because this, you're up against the same... Um, you can see the one spins. I should say it's spinning at the speed of light. You can't be in between it. <laughs> You'd have to be very fast. So, so again, what happens on your belt pack, if you're perfectly up and down, no problem. As you begin to bend and twist, you begin to lose signal. And if you get all the way um, horizontal, again, now you only have one side and that signal has become nearly nothing, right? So as people bend and twist, they're... Um, ability to pick up the transmitter is constantly varying. And what happens with these, um, most, most of the IFBs are, are analog because we don't want to deal with the latency. And what happens with those radios, the quality of the audio is directly proportional to, to the quality of, the, of the, the radio signal it's receiving. So well before it drops out, you start getting noise, you start getting birdies, you know, you get junk um, before it, it completely goes off the air and just the fidelity starts getting crazy. So simply using a circular polarized antenna um, takes care of that problem. You no longer have it. You Again, you don't lose, uh, you, you won't get polarization crossfades. So we make these combiners. So uh, again, this is very simple. You, you plug four transmitters into the one or eight into the other. It resolves it all down to a single antenna that you can then send out. It's plug and play. You don't have to do anything. You just plug transmitters in out to the antenna. So now you can use a single antenna. We can cut down the number of antennas again. Um, and that takes care of that. Uh, so with your IFBs, if they're not reliable and you're using a paddle or a whip antenna, that's probably the reason. Uh, again, we, we could nail the transmitters, I mean, the receivers to the wall so they don't move and we could we could align them. But these things are moving around and people are sitting and standing and bending and twisting. 
and their ability to pick up the signal is going up and down and up and down. So like it's mostly in 20, but then it dips and then it goes up and, you know, it's, it's just changing. So we need to smooth that out um, and keep it above that, uh, above that level. Um, I want to talk about this too. This is something I don't know if you've used uh, bandpass filters before or not, but this is becoming more and more important every day. Uh, we make this series of bandpass filters. Um, you can see there's a bunch of uh, ranges. Basically what this does is this blocks RF below and above this number. So use these on your wireless mics now. You, you use these with the receivers. To use them with IFBs, you would have to put one on each IFB a receiver, which would be bulky and expensive. So uh, you don't have to worry about IFBs because you're transmitting a single signal. But when you're receiving, you're, you're grabbing everything from the universe coming into that antenna. So um, if, you, if you travel a lot, uh, this new one that we have at the bottom, 470 to 608, basically works anywhere in North America. You don't have to worry about what gear you have. Uh, if you travel a lot uh, and, you know, depending on what blocks your your gear is in, uh, you know, you get off the bus and it may not work in some cities and it works in other cities just because, you know, basically where the TV stations are. So I want to show you, um, I did this sweep. Um, uh, I was in Las Vegas at a convention and um, this is, so where we can tune the wireless mics to is um, where the green is. There's see there's a little spot up high that that you guys can use too. Anyway, so down at the bottom of that, the garbage is mostly produced by video walls, um, LED lighting, and above that 608 figure, that's what happens from T-Mobile. So when we put the bandpass filters in, look what happens. The dark green right about here. That's noise floor. And we have in this particular case, and I got to tell you, this one amazed me and I'll probably never see it again. I dropped the noise floor over 15 dB. Remember, we're trying to hit 20. That's the thing we got to do. If you only remember one thing from well, everything I say today, that hitting that 20 dB of dynamic range so that you lock up your receiver, that's the thing you got to do. So by dropping the noise floor, I would say using those filters probably is going to get most people four to six dB. Um, uh, normally, it depends where you are. You know, obviously on top of a mountain in Idaho is different than in the middle of Times Square, right? So we're always, every time we use wireless, it's essentially un a unique situation because everything will have changed. You don't have to go very far to make it change and somebody's brought new gear and you got to keep up with all that. So that's what we're kind of trying to, to work around. So using these bandpass filters, our bandpass, fil other people make bandpass filters. For you guys with electro equipment, they make bandpass filters that are very narrow and they go block by block by block by block. So you have to have a set for every block that you use, but their filters don't roll off very quickly. They're only second order filters. So, so the slopes are, are rather slow. Our filters are um, sixth order filters and they, you know, you can't build a brick wall filter, but these work pretty quick. You have to really chop off the top to keep that T-Mobile out. And uh, so, you know, what happens is if you're in a situation where there's a lot of people around and they got cell phones in their pockets, undoubtedly they have, um, you know, somebody's got T-Mobile phones and that mixes with your wireless mics and raises the noise floor. So if we can block those at the antenna level from coming in and getting to your receivers, uh, you greatly enhance your chances of staying on the air. Um, and these are just, they're passive. They're just plug and play. Doesn't matter what direction you plug them in. You just put this from your antenna going into your distro or going into your receiver. If you do it into a receiver, you need one for the A side, one for the B side, and then it covers all your mics. You got two mics or 200 mics, it covers all of them. So that's uh, that's a very simplified thing. Um, I, I talked about this a little, maybe everybody wasn't on the air yet, but um, there's no problem mixing gear. Uh, you don't have to match logos, right? We all use, 
as far as the antenna systems go, we use electromagnetic waves that are a force of nature. You know, they're the same everywhere in the universe. So you can mix and match brands to your heart's content uh, as long as the frequent you got the right frequency bands. Um, and the FCC makes it pretty difficult for that not to happen. So you never have to worry about, about mixing any brands of anything together, just in case uh, I get people ask. I also get people ask, I'll just throw it in here. Don't my antenna leads need to be the same length? And the answer is no. Uh, if you have one really long one and one really short one, you're going to get a stronger signal on the short side compared to the long side because there's loss in the cable. But there's no problem doing that. In fact, sometimes we do that on purpose because it might make sense. So you've still got signal on both sides. The, the fact that they're not symmetrical isn't screwing anything up. You will just have a hotter side and a, and a less hot side. Uh, so I think that um, basically covers what I wanted to talk about. Um, and as long as, you, as long as you remember that, that that capture ratio, that's the thing we have to do. So everything that we we don't point our antennas, Larry gave me a whole list of questions here, and all of them are answered back to that, <laughs> that, that 20 dB, that capture ratio at the top. So anything you do that subtracts from that is beginning to be a problem. And uh, like I said, we're, we're basically dealing with a straw that breaks the camel's back kind of situation. You have a lot of little straws. None of them by themselves are particularly important until you add that one last straw that gets you below that 20 dB threshold. And so all these things that we can do to lower the noise floor and, and increase that uh, just work in our favor. Now, sometimes there's going to be situations <laughs> that are going to be extremely difficult. Um, you know, working in the middle of Times Square, you got to put 60 microphones on in Times Square. Well, I worked, I worked with the guys at the Super Bowl about six years ago and the, the, with the coordinators, uh, and they use every brand of everything that they can get their hands on. Uh, I was making a digital radio that, uh, that they needed to use. I asked them how many holes they needed to fill on game day. You ready for this? 3,000. They got a 3,000 requests for radio. I would just shoot myself and get it over with. There's three guys spend about three weeks trying to plan that. And of course, you know, you get your time and your frequency from 315, you know, to 327 and you're gone and somebody else gets it. But they've got to coordinate. And that's not all just microphones. I mean, they have, they count the number of hot dogs they sell wirelessly and ticket taking and all this stuff. And they got stages outside the stadium. They got all these things going at the same time. But that's an awful lot of radios to coordinate. And uh, frankly, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> Scare the hell out of me. Yeah, it, it does that. Uh, as I said, I, I work as a frequency coordinator there at the Auburn University Stadium. And, and we ran mm -hmm. into that where uh, s supposedly everybody was supposed to clear with me before they came in. But sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. There was one particular case I remember that uh, very vividly is I always went over the day before and got with the TV trucks and got all that squared away. Well, I came in on a Saturday morning and I looked on the sideline and there was some risers down there and like six wireless mics on stands. I said, mm -hmm. what the heck is that? So I go down there and uh, the guy that was down there, I said, what is all this? He said, Oh, we, the, the choir, the, the uh, Auburn Corral is going to sing and they're going to do all this kind of stuff. I said, you, you didn't coordinate these frequencies. I said, what frequency are they on? Uh, I don't know. They just handed me a box with some mics and said, put them on the stands. And yeah. so I looked at them, and I think CBS was there that day. And four of the six frequencies I had already assigned to CBS. And I asked, I told him, I said, you're going to have to change four of these. He said, I don't know how to do that. Oh, they just showed me how to turn it on. <laughs> so coordination is really critical. And because you talked about the 3,000, and I thought I thought uh, the, the 100, I would normally get, uh, I forgot the name of the company that coordinates the stuff for the trucks, uh, CP Communications, that's who it is. And mm -hmm. I used to get a, uh email from them on Sunday for next Saturday's game. And typically, ESPN or ABC, whoever's coming in, will request maybe 70 
for 75 different frequencies for all their stuff. That includes backup. And so I mm-hmm. could sort of get those all squared away. And then everybody else, I had places to put them. Uh, so coordination is a real big thing. And I, I think in NFL, if you don't, if you don't check in ahead of time with the coordinator, sometimes they will actually escort you out of the stadium. They're, they're pretty, they're pretty strict on their coordination, I think. Yeah, they have people that walk through the stands and are, are measuring all the time. And you know what happens is a, a lot of times if they get um, if they have a like a foreign star on the team or something, all of a sudden, you know, they, they'll send a. You know, a news crew from some third world country to cover this guy and they got who knows what for equipment they uh, <laughs> and they just show up. Right. They don't even let you know. And all of a sudden they turn on all this stuff and your coordination goes crazy. Um, because yeah, they do. And that's, that's, that's the biggest danger that that's when things go to hell. Uh, cause you have no time to fix this <laughs> and you need to, you're live, you're going. So you, you want to fix that up. Um, I used to have that problem with the, the jumbotron folks have their own cameras and they had their own, uh, wireless PL systems. And mm-hmm. I had frequencies assigned for them, but I, then I would notice on my analyzer once the game I started, they were on different frequencies. And I went and asked the tech guy one day, I said, why, why are y'all on the different frequencies than I gave you? He said, well, we were told that just before the game starts to clear scan our units and find a clear frequency and it will automatically lock on it. I said, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I said, that frequency may be clear because the network guy maybe have not turned on his mic yet. And you land on it, then then you've knocked that guy out. So I said, don't. Once I give you a frequency, don't be clear scanning. He said, well, the company said that's what we were supposed to do. I said, the company was wrong. You you stick what I tell you to, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, talk to the coordinator. There's there's the law. Yeah, let's talk in the in the few minutes we got uh, left here. Uh, some scenarios, and let's talk about TV, for example, in a new set where you would have several wireless mics and several IFBs. If, uh-huh. if, a, if, a, if a TV station is having trouble with dropouts, uh, as, and I've seen this happen sometime with, with the weather guy, especially if he gets up and he walks over to the green screen, or now a lot of them are not using green screens, they're using LED screens, and you'll hear this burst. All of a sudden, it'll just sound like a, interfere just gonna rrr, and then it'll go away w- what is the best process or procedure for if a station is having issues to troubleshoot that is there a simple uh, way <laughs> no i mean you you have to go down the the basic troubleshooting schemes i mean in that particular case it's because some some transmitter for a short spike Sent, sent a signal and you got it and it was it dropped you below that 20 and until that comes back one of the things you want to watch um probably doesn't happen too much uh when you when you do things ahead of time but i have problems a lot of times people will put their transmitters their belt pack transmitters they put them in their pockets so there is an enormous difference so if you were to put a belt pack transmitter in your pocket to where the antenna is only the thickness of the piece of cloth of your pocket away from your skin, you're probably losing 60% of the transmit power. Uh, Radios do not like big bags of salty water. So that compared to being on your back, uh, half an inch off your skin, I mean, you're still gonna probably lose 20% at that point, but um, there's an enormous difference. And I know that gets to be, especially, you know, hooking up women and their clothes and they're worried about what all these <laughs> all those packs on their back look like and all that, that sometimes you have difficulty uh, in that area. But you got to keep the you got to keep the antennas off their skin, because, again, if you lose if you lose all that power transmitting, your dynamic range is falling down. So it, when you hold that, if that's why wireless mic sticks generally work much better. I I generally just rule of thumb consider them about 6 db hotter than a belt pack next to your body um 
you know, it has an antenna, it's next to your skin, but it's only, it's only the size of your hand, not your whole body. And, you know, um, two, uh, 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 belt packs work a whole lot better on little skinny people than they do on big people. So it's going to work better on somebody that weighs 95 pounds than somebody that weighs 300 pounds. That's just the way it is. You know, the bigger, the bigger the bag of salt water, the more interference you're going to get from it. So that would be something uh, to look at. As far as that particular one spike, so to your example, what you really need, I mean, you need a spectrum analyzer. Uh, if you're working without a spectrum analyzer, we used to be able to do that. I used to be able to guess really good because it was easy because I had so much bandwidth, you know, I could, couldn't miss, just throw a dart and you could you hit the bullseye every time. Uh, now there's very little space left and you have to really do find those open spaces. And then you have to coordinate. You have to use a coordination program um, to, to, to uh, tune all your radios. Otherwise, they step on each other. And again, when the guy walks over, that's it's different than when he walks back to the desk because he's now moved 10 or 12 feet. And while that doesn't seem like much for a microphone, for a radio, when you're dealing with a wavelength that's six inches long, uh, you know, you flip phase 10 times in that distance and all kinds of things can happen. So, um, yeah, you, you really need to get a spectrum analyzer. You need to... Ah, well, like I was talking about with the LED interference and the and the cell phone interference, we recommend that you scan about 50 megahertz above and below what frequencies you're ever going to use, right? So if you're if you're using if you're only using electro block 21, whatever that frequency is, do about 50 megahertz on either side of that. If your stuff is scattered throughout the band, or you're setting up a new studio, we work with that a lot where it could be anywhere from 470 to 608. You know, you, you should scan, you know, 420, 430 on the bottom up to 650, 660, because these um, frequency coordination programs only work based on the data you give them. So if you, if you scan with a receiver that won't look, you know, much beyond its own block, the program assumes that everything else above and below that is zero and it's not it never is so if you give it more information i talk to the engineers at sure that do wireless workbench i'm sure a lot of you use that um and i asked him i said if i give it data that's you know out of the band i'm trying to use but there he says oh yeah you'll get a better coordination so the better the better scan you can give it the better probably i mean i might not be sometimes but i would count on it you know nine out of ten times or 99 out of 100 times being better with the scan that is that takes into account as much out of band information as you can give it you you mentioned setting up a new facility and all and that's that's a good question if some if you're building a new facility and, I, and again i'm maybe talking about a tv news set uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the good guidelines of antenna placement? How, how would you go about placing not only the, the ones for the wireless mic, but also for the in-ears? Is, is there so, sort of a way to do that? Well, so um, antennas have a pattern. Um, and you just need, so basically we deal with a horizontal. Uh, we're not worried about the vertical pattern unless you're, doing the Royal Albert Hall that has four balconies or something. But um, so we look at the horizontal coverage. So a, a whip antenna is, is omnidirectional in 360 horizontally. It's actually donut shaped. It's, it's dead on above and below it. If you put a whip antenna up on a, up on a truss or something and turn it sideways. So it's, you need to turn it sideways. So it's shooting down. If you have it straight up and down, it's really kind of dead, or at least it's, it's, attenuated above and below that i mean you put that if you're using an omni antenna it's got to go in the middle of whatever it is you're trying to pick up so that works well on a golf course that works well on a you know a, a horse arena or something like that but you probably want to use my choice would always be to start with a directional antenna 
like a paddle. They're generally 120 degrees wide. So if you use a paddle and you put it in the corner of a rectangular room, it'll flood that whole room. Everything that you have, um, everything that has direct line of sight. So, you know, just put your eyes where you plan to put that antenna and you need to be able to see all your transmitters. It's generally rule of thumb, human vision's about 120 degrees wide. So it's about the same as that paddle. So if you can see it, you're going to get to it. If you've blocked it, then you need to deal with that. You may need to add another antenna specifically for one area because you have a big set piece that may be blocking. You know, it's not an open room. Uh, that's That happens frequently. If you have multiple studios, we do this a lot where they have three or four studios and then maybe they want the weather guy to go outside some days and they got a little patio they, they shoot from or something. You need to have an A and a B antenna in each in each space. It's just way too risky to, you know, I mean, the, the radio waves will penetrate the walls. It depends what your walls are made out of, but, but, or, you know, what your set piece blocks. Um, but uh, the much better way is to, is to have an A and a B antenna in each, uh, each space. And then what you use, we make a product called a four zone combiner that will allow you to use four pairs, four A's and four B's. So you could do four different rooms. You bring them all back to this box. The problem when you have lots of antennas is now you want them to be very weak. Well, you never want your antenna to be stronger than you need. This is kind of the thing with radio that that's not intuitive, right? So if I have an antenna and I have somebody that's no more than 50 feet away from me, I don't want that antenna going for 300 feet or 600 feet or six miles because inevitably there's more noise out there that it's picking up. So if I have somebody that's 50 feet away, it would be great if I could have an antenna that stopped at 51 feet. Uh, it can't quite do that. But um, so what we want to do is attenuate our antennas. In fact, uh, you uh, if you really want to do a high-end job, I mean, the guys that do arena-level shows, if you want to go see Elton John at the Enorma Dome, um, they pad their antennas. They want to... Uh, they want to attenuate all the signal that they don't need. Because when you do that, so we're back to that dynamic range because everything is that 20 dB. That's the difference between the top and the bottom. So if I pad that 6 dB, I move the signal level down 6 dB and I move the noise down 6 dB. But I've still got whatever range I have. I've just scaled it up or down. So that dynamic range is important to staying on the air. However, Lowering that noise floor is important to the radio. So radios, if you look up the specs, you'll see something called Synad. And that basically tells you how sensitive a radio is. If I drop the noise floor with a 6 dB pad, I will have improved the sensitivity of that radio by 6 dB. I'm not really worried about the signal level. I mean, there's a point at which you would go off the air because you don't have sufficient signal level but it's not the signal level, it's the dynamic range, right? So as long as we keep the dynamic range up, uh, actually not having enough signal isn't your problem. You have enough signal, the problem is you have too much noise mixed in with it. And it's a little different way to look at it, but that's really what you have to deal with. So um, padding, so that, that this multi-zone has, has attenuators for each, um, each antenna, because you don't want... Uh, you Well, let me turn it the other way. You do want your transmitter to find one A antenna and one B antenna. They don't even have to be in the same zone sometimes. But that's all you want it to see. So unless you have quite a bit of distance between those rooms, that will never be perfect. But we, we balance those antennas out to not have any more than we need. Any more than we need when we're going backwards. So... Um, you know, it's 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 the same way for IFBs. You gotta you have to focus the antenna where the transmitters, I mean, where the receivers are gonna be in that case. And as long as as long as you maintain line of sight and you maintain 20 dB of dynamic range, you're good to go. Uh, there are some specialty antennas. We make an antenna, I should at least talk about it. 
Um, we make this antenna called a spotlight, and this is wonderful, especially for any of you guys that do um, outdoor stuff. Um, I have one customer in Los Angeles, a PA company, but they tend to do all the, um, the, the press conferences at the Staples Center, you know, where the Lakers play basketball and the Kings play hockey. And for some reason, they like to do these press conferences outside. And if you're familiar with Los Angeles, if you're standing in downtown Los Angeles, you can look up 11 miles the hill to Mount Wilson. There's 26 500 kilowatt TV stations bearing down on you. There's no space outside. You're on the street. You're just being blasted by this. And so we make this flat antenna that goes on the ground. Actually, I can show you here. Wait a minute. This would probably be good because this is something you should know about. Let me show you this one. Um, so we make this antenna, it's called a spotlight and it's a limited coverage antenna. So this is where we don't need distance, but we need to reject so much outside noise. Let me show you, I got a little video here. Let's... Hi, I'm Don from RF Venue. And today we're looking at our spotlight antenna, which is a limited coverage antenna that's intended to reduce your noise floor and to help you get more channels in very crowded RF situations like we have here at this convention. So as you can see right now, we're scanning uh, the, uh, this entire floor. We have an awful lot of uncoordinated radio interference, which would be very typical in a big city or where you have around TV stations, you have a lot of microphones working. And what we're gonna show is that with our limited coverage antenna, the pickup, we simply ignore things as they start to be getting a little too far away from us. So if I switch over and show you, you see we've reduced the noise floor considerably. We've opened up a lot more area where I could be using additional microphones. So if I needed to use additional channels very close to where I am right here, I've now opened up that area quite a bit and you can see. So if you're if you're outside, um, we use these, all oh, the guys at, um, what was that called? Chicago Fire. You know, they shoot that outside in uh, in Chicago, right? And they just couldn't get channels. They just, the, the TV was killing them. So here's an antenna that basically works about 50 feet from the center of it in any direction. And beyond that, it doesn't really pick up very much of anything. So it basically knocks the TV channels off the air as far as you picking them up. It creates a bubble. And if you're inside the bubble, um, this picks you up. And when you get outside the buzz bubble, it basically just stops working so for guys that work outside uh especially in metro areas where there's a lot of tv you know if they've got 10 or 12 or 20 tv stations on the air that's frequencies you can't tune to and so by using this antenna outside um you, you open that area back up so if you need to get a lot of microphones obviously the more mics you work with the harder it is right it's Lots easier to get one channel to work than it is to get eight or to get 60, you know, so it just depends what you're doing. But right. uh, that's a that's a real neat antenna that you really ought to have in your toolbox um, just for those times where nothing else is going to work. Well, Don, I, I want to uh, thank you for being with us. This has been a, a most interesting program and I, it was to me and I'm sure for the folks it's uh, uh, on the call with us, you really brought out some stuff that that I didn't know about, and I'm sure to be helpful to uh, to all the other people that's on the call. So once again, thank you, Don, and uh, don't be a stranger. You can be back with us again sometime, and and uh, uh, you have um, a way they can contact you if anybody has any questions. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, well, you can go to our website and, and look at technical support. And I've got my cell phone number, so let's see if you want to call me. Happy to take calls. Uh, please remember, I'm in California. Don't call me at five in my morning. You get me <laughs> in my bunny slippers, you're going to get a funny answer. But um, Or my email is just don, D-O-N, at rfvenue.com. And I'm happy to entertain your questions, whether you're buying stuff from us or somebody else, because we just want all this stuff to work. And so That's happy right. to share whatever I can with you. Okay. Well, we appreciate all the insight that you gave us today. And we want to thank everybody for being with us today and uh, remind you that our our uh, webinar for February will be on uh, the third Tuesday of February, which is the 20th. And I think we have scheduled for that some people from Sabre Tower. 
to talk about uh, tower issues and tower construction and, and how to maintain them. So we want to thank everybody for being with us, and we'll see you again next month. Thanks, guys.